Welcome everyone to the Society of Critical Care Medicine's ICU Liberation webcast, an integrated approach to ICU delirium assessment, prevention, and management. My name is Vishaka Kumar and I'm the manager for quality implementation programs at the Society of Critical Care Medicine, and I have no relevant disclosures. This webcast is funded by the Society of Critical Care Medicine's Council to encourage implementation of the 2013 Clinical Practice Guidelines for the Management of Pain, Agitation, and Delirium in Adult Patients in the ICU. This webcast will include approximately 40 minutes of content. Due to the short nature of this educational activity, there will, be, there will not be any CE or CMEs offered. You're invited to ask questions for our presenters throughout the webcast. You may do so by typing your questions into the question box in your GoToWebinar panel. Questions will be addressed after the presentation. You will also have the opportunity to participate in an interactive poll. When you see the poll, simply click the bubble next to your choice. This webcast will be available at www.iculiberation.org or on SECM's YouTube channel the next business day. We invite you to share this and the many other ICU liberation webcasts and patient stories with your colleagues widely. Post on Facebook if you like, if you like this webcast and if you tweet, tweet on using the webcast to spread the word using hashtag ICU Lib. It is now my pleasure to introduce our presenters for today. Our first distinguished presenter today is Dr. John Devlin. Dr. Dr. Devlin is a professor of pharmacy at Northeastern University and a member of scientific staff in the Division of Pulmonology and Critical Care and Sleep, care me and sleep Medicine and Critical Care Pharmacist at Tufts Medical Center. His federally funded research program is focused on the detection, prevention, and treatment of delirium in the ICU and the use and assessment of sedation in critically ill. Over his career, Dr. Devlin has published more than 100 papers in the pharmacy and ICU literature is a member of editorial boards of critical care medicine and pharmacotherapy, and currently chairs an international group for SECM that is focused on developing new pain, agitation, delirium, and early mobilization and sleep practice guidelines for the critically ill adults. Our second presenter for today is Dr. Michelle Bayliss. Dr. Bayliss is an associate professor at Ohio State University College of Nursing Center of Excellence in Critical and Complex Care. A former John Hartford Building Geriatric Nursing Capacity Pre-Doctoral Scholar and Claire Fagan Postdoctoral Fellow at the University of Pennsylvania College of Nursing. Dr. Bayless's program of research focuses on improving the physical, functional, and cognitive outcomes of critically ill older adults. An active member of the Society of Critical Care Medicine, Dr. Bayless is also a current steering committee member of the ICU Liberation ABCDEF Bundle Campaign. For disclosures, Dr. Do Dr. Devlin has research fundings from NIA, NHLBI, MLNOW, Hospira, and AstraZeneca. Dr. Michelle Bayliss has research funding from Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Interdisciplinary, Interdisciplinary Nursing Quality Research Initiative, Alzheimer's Association, and Speakers Bureau, Hospira, and France Foundation. I now hand it over to Michelle to begin the presentation. Thanks, Vishaka. Greetings from the great state of Ohio. As Vishaka said, my name is Michelle Ballas, and I'm currently an associate professor here at the Ohio State University College of Nursing in the Center of Critical and Complex Care. I'd like to start the presentation by thanking the Society of Critical Care Medicine for sponsoring this program, and also um, truly acknowledging in particular all of the excellent work that the ICU Liberation Team has put um, forth on this effort to date. The efforts are truly having a great impact on um, all of our IC patients at both the national and global level. We're going to do, we have several goals to accomplish today in today's webinar. We are going to first talk about um, the importance of routine delirium screening in the ICU. We're also going to help you identify more successfully some of the modifiable risk factors for delirium, things that we might be able to change while our patients are under our care talk about some non-pharmacologic strategies to reduce the burden of delirium, and also um, discuss the, the rather limited role that medication-focused interventions currently have in the treatment of ICU deliriums. 
One of the major challenges affecting um, really effective delirium assessment, prevention, and management in the ICU setting is all the different terms that have been used and still are currently used to describe the syndrome. For example, it's common to um, use, see terms, I'm sorry, let me just go back for a second, um, terms such as acute confusional state, confusion is very often used, ICU psychosis, acute brain syndrome, we're still using the term encephalopathy a lot. And um, unfortunately, the term sundowning often comes up in the ICU setting. Um, one of my personal favorites that luckily hasn't caught too tight of hold was the just ain't right syndrome, um, taught to me by one of my mentors at HUP, Liz Dotson, when I was starting, first starting as a SICU nurse there. I remember the numerous patients that we cared for that were experiencing mental status changes or behaviors that, as Liz simply put it, that patient just ain't right. Back then, the term delirium was just starting to emerge in the ICU literature. Um, and as I said, one of the reasons for the confusion surrounding the term delirium relates to the fact that it was really only relatively recently that we had a way to detect delirium without the help of our psychiatric colleagues. For example, Dr. Sharon Inouye developed the CAM back in 1990, and one of the first tools used to detect uh, delirium in the ICU wasn't developed until 2001, so really less than 15 years ago. Um, I personally feel one of the most important terms that we need to clarify on this list um, is that the difference between delirium and dementia. Uh, it's really important to note that dementia is more of the chronic progressive form of brain injury in comparison to delirium that often has an acute onset. Importantly, uh, patients with dementia can and often do to develop uh, delirium on top of their dementia, particularly when they're severely ill and in the hospital setting. So while there's a new version of the DSM um, out, the key features of delirium really haven't changed over the years. Um, to be diagnosed as delirious, really the patients have to display a disturbance in their consciousness and have a reduced ability to really focus, sustain, or shift attention. So as we'll see when we look at the tools, attention is really going to be key to the um, accurate detection of delirium. They also often experience a change in cognition or the development of perceptual disturbances that's not better accounted by pre-existing, established, or an evolving dementia. Delirium often develops over a short period of time, and you'll see this classic fluctuation in mental status that occurs once patients are delirious. And there's also evidence from the history and physical and or labs that the disturbance is often related to either a medical condition, which is often frequently not diagnosed yet, substance intoxication or withdrawal, or a medication side effect. Unfortunately, persons with delirium often experience other really distressing symptoms, um, and I'm sure you're, you've, you've seen these symptoms in your patients before. They can experience things like hallucinations or delusions. They often have really impaired um, sleep problems and sleep disturbances, so the importance of sleep in the ICU, we'll talk about it a little bit later, but really needs to be emphasized. And they also have a, um, abnormal psycho met, um, psychomotor activity. So they vacillate between periods of agitation and lethargy. And they can also experience some really other frightful emotional disturbances, such as fear, anger, depression, and apathy. We also know that there's um, three subtypes of delirium that have been described in the literature. By far, the most common that we see in the ICU setting is the hypoactive form of delirium. Um, we're often able to uh, notice mental status change or changes quicker in those patients that have the hyperactive form. So those patients that are really have hyperactive motor activity or trying to pull, pull out their lines and tubes and things like that. Um, and also the form, another form is the mixed form where, again, they've, they go back and forth between periods of hypoactivity and hyperactivity. This slide is um, purposely kind of burdensome. Um, it really shows the different pathways and the pathophysiology behind delirium. It, succinctly stated, we really um, are still getting a grips on a, a better understanding of the pathophysiology of delirium. Um, most often, uh, the current thinking is that there's changes either in the anatomic deficit, there's change, anatomic deficits and imbalances in neurotransmitters, neurotransmitters which can modulate control of cognition, function, behavior, and mood. But as you can see by this slide, the theories there's a variety of theories that are attempting to explain the pathophysiology, but we still really don't have a tight 
under, uh, understanding of what exactly the cause of delirium is. I'm going to pass off the slide now to John. Thanks very much, Michelle. So, um, you know, one of the most important reasons that we want to uh, recognize delirium in our patients and prevent it is there's many, many serious short and long-term effects of delirium on our, on our uh, patients we care for every day. Um, just trying to get the slides to move here. Can you move my slide? Okay, oh, there we go. Um, so we have a patient, you know, like this who we might be caring for in the ICU, and as uh, you know, Michelle mentioned, we might see fear, depression, um, sleep might be altered, um, and probably the most bothersome things are things that we might not necessarily see in the ICU. So persistent cognitive defects, uh, decreased functional ability, which really could um, drive a patient who is, uh, you know, living alone to um, potentially require admission to a SNF or a nursing home. Um, a huge amount of stress to families. Um, they have a huge burden of care for many of, uh, you know, particularly older adults that are discharged from the ICU with delirium. Um, you know, there's both short and long-term mortality increases. Um, and all of this, of course, has tremendous um, increases in healthcare costs. So let's dive into this just a little bit more uh, detail here. So when we look at um, generally more recent data shows that we have, you know, about 60% of uh, mechanically ventilated patients will develop delirium in the ICU. But this number is really quite variable. It really depends on the underlying population of patients. And um, as we'll talk about near the end of the presentation, it's really going to focus on particularly some of the non-pharmacologic interventions um, that are done to help prevent or decrease the burden delirium. And there's also the ability of clinicians at the bedside to reduce uh, modifiable risk. So this number in many institutions has, thank God, started to uh, to draw, but it, it's still high no matter how you slice it. We certainly know that patients uh, with delirium are going to spend more days on mechanical ventilation. And of course, this is going to uh, lead to a longer um, stay in the ICU. Patients often are re-intubated, sometimes they're even readmitted to the ICU for um, delirium-related sequelae. Um, when we look in the ICU mortality, um, it's definitely higher, although more recent data has demonstrated that this is very, very dependent on um, changes in severity of illness. So patients that are getting sicker over the course of the ICU stay, um, you know, this is a big factor in mortality. Um, one of the most important things, and, th and this has uh, been shown in multiple studies, is that the l number of days or the duration of delirium that patients experience is associated with um, increased longer-term mortality, um, ranging from uh, you know uh, six at six months up to one year, and that's what's shown in this Kaplan-Meier curve. And you can simply sh see here that um, as the number of days of duration of delirium increase, the survival actually drops. So again, this is a, a very very important. Um, Point because we're trying when we recognize delirium, there's a, a lot of things that we're trying to do to try to decrease the duration of it. And of course, as I already alluded to, um, we're going to see increased hospital costs as, as well as increased societal costs with this. Um, I think what an, a, one area that there's been a lot of recent literature is looking at the long-term cognitive effects of delirium. Um, so we certainly know, uh, you know delirium in the ICU is an independent risk factor for long-term cognitive impairment. Um, and this is um, per both profound and persistent. Um, you know, well, at least a year after hospital discharge and in many patients longer. Um, in the recent brain ICU study by uh, uh, Pratik Pandharapandi and colleagues, um, they found that, you know, 34% of the patients had cognitive function at one year that was similar you know, cognitive abnormalities, it was similar to uh, survivors of traumatic brain injury. 24% had um, cognitive um, abnormalities at one year that was similar to a patient with Alzheimer's disease. Um, and the interesting thing is this is not just in older adults. Um, you know, in some of the ICU survivors who were, you know, younger in their 40s and 50s, they also saw many of these same uh, sequelae. And as we alluded to, this is a substantial burden on patients and their families. 
Um, lastly, um, looking at more results from the uh, brain ICU study, again, this hits to the point that the number of the more days you have with delirium in the ICU, um, your cognitive scores at one year are going to be worse. So again, you know, I'm kind of emphasizing this a lot, but if we can shorten the duration of delirium or prevent it altogether, um, we're really going to imp help improve both the shorter and long-term outcomes. Um, just to highlight, um, you know, delirium outcomes, and these are from the uh, 2013 PAD guidelines. Uh, you know, we know delirium is associated with increased mortality, um, increased prolonged ICU stay and length of stay, and um, we also know it's associated with development of post-ICU cognitive impairment. And with that, I think I'll turn it over to you, Michelle. Thanks, John. So one thing that uh, I, I'm sure you guys have a sense of by now, that detecting delirium can be tough in the ICU setting. There's a number of factor, factors that contribute to the difficulty, and I'm sure you're aware of most of these as well. Our patients are often voiceless, so that really, uh, up until recently, limited our ability to use many of the non-ICU screening tools. They frequently have a reduced level of consciousness, and this is often due to the side effects of certain medications that we're giving in the ICU, um, the sedatives, but often sometimes, um, particularly in the frail older adult, things that can be used to treat pain, like opiates, often have a sedative effect with older adults. Of course, their medical instability often limits our ability to effectively identify delirium, and we often don't have psychiatrists available in the ICU setting that can come and, and do a really great um, mental status test and, and screening for delirium because of the things that we outlined before. And again, one of the other problems is you know, knowing that the, delir the subtypes of delirium and the fluctuation in mental status that the patients have, one minute the patient may seem fine, but classic with delirium is, um, another hour later, they may either, either be hypoactive or hyperactive. So this really makes identifying delirium ch um, challenging in the ICU setting. Nevertheless, uh, years of research uh, show that the importance of delirium assessment, and it's now also offered in the PAD guidelines, um, there are several suggestions relating to the importance of screening for delirium. So according to the PAD guidelines, they do recommend that routine monitoring and we'll talk about what routine may be um, in a few, but re they recommend that routine monitoring for delirium in all adult ICU patients. They further suggest that um, the, the CAM ICU or the Confusion Assessment Method ICU and the Intensive Care Delirium Screening Checklist are the most valid and reliable delirium monitoring tools in this population. Now there's a, a variety of other tools that have been used prior <laughs> in the Intensive Care Unit, but these are the two that are now uh, recommended by the new PAD guidelines. And also, they, um, they note that routine monitoring for delirium in adult ICU patients is um, feasible in everyday clinical practice. So let's just do a, sh a short poll to see how many of you guys are out there are listening. But we are very curious in knowing which instrument does your ICU currently use to assess for delirium. So if you can take a minute and just select one on the screen. Looks like we have 299 attendees, so we should have a pretty robust response. Okay, great. So I think this will make my job a little bit easier. It looks like um, two-thirds of you almost are, use the CAM ICU already in your intensive care unit to screen for delirium, followed by the, um, I think the next one was the intensive care delirium screening checklist. That's perfect. So let's just, for those people that might not be familiar with the CAM ICU, let's just talk a little bit about what the screening tool can and cannot do for you. So one of the most widely used tools in the CAM ICU and on this, uh, members of this webinar today, is the CAM ICU. The CAM ICU assesses for the four essential features of delirium that we talked about briefly on the previous slide of the DSM, uh, DSM diagnostic criteria. One of the best things about the CAM ICU is really how quick it is to administer. Um, once you're, it's easily less than five minutes when you're comfortable using the tool. However, one thing that I'd like to mention is prior to um, using the CAM ICU, 
um, you and your staff will actually really have to know how to perform an accurate assessment of the patient's level of arousal. So with the CAM ICU, it's recommended that you either use the uh, Richmond Agitation and Sedation Scale or the SAS to do that um, level of arousal assessment. So if you can do that um, assessment, you've already actually scored one of the features on the CAM, so feature three. Um, and importantly, if you've done the RAS or the SAS and the patient is in a coma, meaning they scored a minus four or minus five, for example, on the RAS, you can't administer the CAM, so you're actually already done. And that's really a big important takeaway point. You're not going to use the CAM ICU, and, and John will t speak um, in a minute or two, uh, in a minute, a second or two about the intensive care delirium screening checklist. But if the patient is in a coma, so if they're minus four or minus five on the RAS, you will not perform um, or administer the confusion assessment method ICU because the patient can't be assessed for delirium. So the first step in evaluating a patient's delirium status with the CAM ICU is looking at and asking if the patient has developed an acute change or fluctuating course in the patient's mental status. So really looking at things like, was it, is this change in mental status a change from baseline, or has that patient had um, periods of fluctuating mental status during the past 24 hours? If you answer no to that question, you're done. You don't have to do any more of the CAM ICU. The patient cannot be delirious. So if, the, if you answer no to acute change or fluctuating course in mental status, you're done with your CAM ICU. The patient is not delirious. The next step then is to go to um, question number two, which assess, assesses inattention. Now the CAM ICU assesses inattention two ways. There is a picture component, but most frequently ICUs are using the, um, the auditory component, where you ask your patient to squeeze your hand when you say the letter A and then the clinician reads um, uh, sequences of letters like those that are on the screen, save a heart. Um, you're going to check to see if there's errors. So what's considered an error is if the patient fails to squeeze when you say that letter A, or if they squeeze on any other letter than A, that's considered an error. All right, if the patient makes two or more errors, they are considered to have that feature. All right, so they're inattentive and, they're po and that feature of delirium is positive. If your patient's fine and passes that without a problem, you're done with your CAM ICU as well. You don't have to go to steps three and four. Um, step three, we've already done. We've completed our RAS. To score positive on the altered level of consciousness, you need a, um, a, a, a arousal score of anything other than alert and calm. So anything, a RAS score of minus one or lower or plus one or higher would be considered Anything other than zero on that scale would be considered positive for an altered level of consciousness. So if your patient um, does score positive for that altered level of consciousness and the first two symptoms, you're done. Your patient is CAM ICU positive and you do not have to go on to the fourth step. Finally, you, will, um, you may encounter the rare patient that has um, the uh, first two uh, features of delirium, so the acute change in mental status and the inattention, but currently is um, alert and calm. Well, that's, in that case, that's the only time that you'll have to go on to assess disorganized thinking. And you'll do that by asking the, question, the questions that are listed um, under, that, um, under the disorganized thinking scale. And then also having the uh, patient um, follow your command of holding up two fingers. If the patient um, makes an error on those tests, um, that feature is considered positive, and you can stop. If the patient has features one and two and four, they are positive. So to summarize, to test positive for delirium or CAM ICU positive, you need both features one and two, have to have those two, and either feature three or four. So hopefully one of the take-home messages that you'll get from today is the um, first two features have to be present for your patient to have delirium. And John's going to briefly talk about the intensive care delirium screening checklist. Great. So this is a tool that we use at Tufts Medical Center. And, um, and again, to emphasize what uh, Michelle originally mentioned, both these schools are, both these tools are, um, you know, valid and reliable. So institutions shouldn't spend too much time on which one they're using. The most important thing to, is to use one regularly and reliably. Um, similarly to CAM ICU, it's really important to evaluate a patient's level of conscious with your sedation score. Um, similarly to CAM ICU, if patients have a are deeply sedated or in a coma, um, they need to be woken up before they can be evaluated for delirium. 
there's four domains, um, num domain number one, two, three, and four, that need to be evaluated at the bedside. This is one of the differences between the ICDSC and the CAM ICU. And then domain number five, six, seven, and eight are actually observed over the nursing shift as well as collecting data from the nurse caring for the patient on the previous search. Uh, so that's where we're really looking at things like sleep wake or cycle disturbance um, and patient's fluctuation, for example, in um, agitation. Um, if four of these domains are seen, um, there'd be a score of four, and that would be uh, the patient we'd be deemed to have delirium. Go ahead, Michelle. Thanks, John. So obviously, as with any assessment that we do in critical care, <clears throat> using either the CAM-ICU or the intensive care delirium screening checklist, it'll take training. Um, it's also really important to recognize some of the common barriers that people have offered to why they don't screen or why they feel their delirium screening is not um, being as effective as it could. Um, for example, a lot of providers uh, consider the assessment tools too complex to use or that they're, um, they, ha they have the uh, misperception that you cannot complete these tools in a sedated patient, you should be able to administer either tool in a sedated patient other than those patients that are um, so sedated that they're actually in the coma. Um, a lot of people have uh, really lack confidence in their ability to use these tools. So confidence building will be something very, very important in terms of getting these uh, tools into practice uh, uh, reliably. Um, and again, one of the other things uh, that we hear when we go around the country talking about this is a lot of frustration regarding, okay, we're doing these CAM-ICU assessments. Um, they do take nursing time. It, it, most of the time it's the nurses that are doing these assessments, you know, every shift. But you know, we're doing these assessments and then nothing's being done with the results of what we're finding. So, you know, going on to rounds, the nurse reporting, um, for example, the patient's CAM-ICU positive and getting the response, oh, that's great, you know, let me know if you need anything. So really, that, th these barriers offer some tips into important implementation strategies. Now, luckily, the literature is replete with the, uh, there's a lot of examples in the literature that show how you can effectively teach your staff or others how to use these tools. One of the ways is through case-based scenario or using case studies. Um, one study found that the strategy actually increased um, usage of the uh, delirium screening tool by 70% and improved accuracy by 54%. Um, you can do things like spot checking. So having a delirium assessment champion on your unit who will systematically uh, work with the nurses to see if their delirium assessments are congruent, meaning does the delirium expert find the same thing as the um, direct care provider. And again, uh, another important implementation strategy is really trying to, quote unquote, get it into the water. And what we mean by this is um, some of this teaching really should be considered in um, orientation, in particular of, the, of new ICU nurses. So incorporating delirium assessments into um, hospital nursing orientation. We also know um, there, there's some other key tips, and that is, again, making sure that your sedation assessment is regularly and reliably happening. So really working to build first your staff's knowledge or um, the people that will be administering these tools knowledge of how to use the RAS and the SAS in order to assess um, for sedation before you start teaching them about how to do the confusion assessment method or intensive care delaying screening checklist. And again, and you know that's important because you see that that's incorporated in both of those assessment tools. Um, obviously, you're going to need buy-in not only from the nurses, but also from the physicians, pharmacists, respiratory therapists, and ICU managers because everyone needs to speak that common language and understand the terms that are associated with the findings of the delirium assessment tool. Um, there's a ton of education already available. There's great um, references in particular if you're interested in getting things like a resource manual on the CAM ICU, you can find that at um, the icudelirium.org uh, webpage. They have a, va a lot of great resources on how to use um, that tool in particular reliably and effectively. You know, and we also often have to say, going back to my experience when we were calling it the just ain't right syndrome many years ago, we have to realize that nurses in particular have been evaluating many of the symptoms of delirium for years. They just don't realize it. So that importance of the time 
the providers are actually spending with the patients and getting to know the person at um, you know at a really holistic level and what they were like before they came into the ICU and while that while you're um, while they're with them is so so important. Uh, one other question in terms of delirium assessment that um, has recently come up um, based on a study by Patel and others um, about when is the best time to assess for delirium. Well, um, again, the best time is you know one time that's going to be that works best for your units and is consistently applied throughout your units. But um, this study looked at um, you know is when in particular when should the um, the uh, delirium assessments occur before or after SAT. And I really think the takeaway point, one of the takeaway points from this um, study was the fact that, yes, the important thing is to screen for delirium. And it's probably, you know, if you had to choose when you're going to screen for delirium, it's probably best to do so once the patient's been off sedatives for a while. That would probably be the optimal time to do so. Now I'm going to turn it back to John, who's going to um, talk a little bit about delirium risk factor modification. Great. Thanks very much, Michelle. Um, I think it's important when we're, uh, you know, looking at our patients each day at the bedside um, to be thinking about the risk factors that they have for delirium. Um, risk factors can be, um, you know, predisposing, which are often risk factors that the patient comes into the ICU with, and then there's um, risk factors that are uh, precipitating that are things that can happen to the patient or are done to the patient or not done to the patient, which then cause them to have delirium. I think most most importantly, it's, it's important to realize that, you know, some risk factors, as we already alluded to, are modifiable. These are the big ones we should be thinking about regularly. And then, of course, uh, there's some things that are not modifiable. Obviously, someone ha who's older or has a higher severity of illness when they first are admitted to the ICU. It's also important to realize that there's actually, um, you know, first of all, a tremendous body of literature looking at risk factors for delirium in the critically ill. Um, it's important to realize, though, that some of these studies aren't as well done as others. And um, I just wanted to quickly review a recent systematic review that I published with some of my Dutch colleagues where we looked at um, basically all risk fact, prospective risk factor studies from um, 2000, 2013, I, we excluded cardiac surgery studies. These studies we only included that had multivariable analysis and randomization because you need to control for other factors to show something, of course, is, is causative. Um, we looked at study quality. We looked at the number of studies investigating um, each potential risk factor variable. And then we looked at the consistency of direction of association across studies, really trying to see if there's a sort of common risk factors that are being reported in these studies. And what we, interesting enough, um, we identified 1,626 studies. We were only able to use 33 or 2% of these in our systematic review. So there's a lot of studies out there that are really fairly poorly done. I think the other thing that's important to realize is we looked at almost 80 potential risk factors, and not everything that's out there is definitely is is a, a true risk factor. But there's a number of ones we should be thinking of, um, and I've listed these by strong evidence and moderate evidence. But I think what's more important to do is look at the ones that are modifiable versus the ones that aren't modifiable. So obviously. You know, someone who's older has a history of dementia, someone who's a vascular path has hypertension, someone that comes in with surgery or trauma, who's more severely ill, who's on mechanical ventilation, metabolic acidosis, um, that, you know, had a history of consuming alcohol in multiple organ dysfunction. These are all really sort of non-modifiable factors. I think the most important things that we're really going to be focusing on here are, um, you know, medication use. Um, sedation-associated coma, um, benzodiazepine use, um, and potentially dexmedetomidine is protective. Um, so just to emphasize, obviously we know we can't identify, um, you know, screen patients for delirium that are in a coma, but it, the patients that are put into a sedative-induced coma, which occasionally is a goal of therapy for critical ill patients, but I would suggest for most patients it's not a goal of therapy. This is an extremely dangerous state on many levels for patients. Um, and it's a huge independent risk factor for delirium. 
not only that is if someone is deeply sedated, it's going to be much harder to wake them, put them on a spontaneous breathing trial. It's going to be harder to mobilize them, um, and 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 all sorts of other uh, sequelae related to this. Um, there's been a lot of literature looking at the risk of transitioning to delirium with benzodiazepine use. Um, uh, there's certainly the hallmark study from Pratik Pandhari Pandey and his group, and then our group uh, in some Dutch colleagues also looked at midazolam, and really the consistency of these results show that um, if patients are awake without delirium on on any particular ICU day, and they're administered a benzodiazepine, there's a substantial risk that the next day these patients are going to transition to delirium, um, and these odds ratios are substantial. Um, and it's very much dose related. So the more benzodiazepine, it's not just a yes or no um, exposure to benzodiazepine, it's the amount in each day that these patients receive. So for example, you can see this is the probability that patients will go from delirium to, from not having delirium to delirium. And you can see the lorazepam dose in um, the Pandharapandi study really shows a skyrocketing effect. So um, the more lorazepam each day the patient gets, the greater the likelihood the next day the patient is going to have delirium. And this is an important critical uh, modifiable factor since we have other options, including opioids, to uh, be able to sedate our agitated patients. Um, this is a, uh, a list of medication-related delirium strategies that we've actually implemented system-wide at Tufts Medical Center um, that pops up whenever a, a nurse or a physician or a pharmacist anywhere in the hospital documents a potential positive delirium screening. Um, just try to get people looking at risk factors. Um, certainly the big thing is avoiding polypharmacy, ensuring the medication dose is appropriate. The higher the dose you use, the greater the risk for delirium-related side effects. Sometimes you will see medication withdrawal, for example, if opioids or benzodiazepines were used in the ICU. As patients transition over the ICU and these agents are completely stopped, sometimes patients will develop delirium-like symptoms. Um, certainly try to avoid anticholinergic medications whenever possible, or at least reducing the dose or duration of these agents. We talked about benzos. Um, try to avoid non-benzodiazepine sleep medications. Use the uh, lowest effective dose of a corticosteroid. Um, you know, obviously, we want to be focused on treating patients' pain, um, but it is important to start thinking about transitioning to the lowest effective dose as patients move throughout the ICU. Um, there's little role for metoclopramide in patients, um, particularly the elderly, particularly patients with renal dysfunction. If delirium occurs in the patient receiving an H2 receptor antagonist, um, probably switch to a PPI. Um, Kepro or levetiracin um, also um, can cause delirium-like effects, so consider other anticonvulsant options. Um, antibiotics actually um, have some risk for delirium, so this is another reason if um, to you know step down or discontinue or try to decrease the use of antibiotics when they're not warranted. Um, patients being diuresed will certainly show signs of diarrhea, um, of dehydration, electrolyte abnormalities, which can be um, you know give delirium-like symptoms. And then lastly, it's important if. Uh, patients are on a neuro uh, CNS active agent where drug levels can be drawn, for example, a good one would be um, phenytoin, it's important to check levels and um, obviously intervene when they're super therapeutic. Go ahead, Michelle. Thanks, John. So that was a great um, overview of some of the medication-related things to con consider when we're looking at the uh, prevention and treatment of ICU delirium. And I just want to reemphasize, and hopefully this will be one of the takeaway messages from this great webinar, but I really want to emphasize that the, the treatment of delirium is really identifying and removing the underlying cause of delirium. So that is so very important. Um, if you remember in the DSM criteria, it gave you a list of physiologic um, variables that are associated with the development of delirium or that can cause delirium. So it's really important to focus on the assessment of those risk factors and removing and treating those things that may be causing the patient to become delirious. So really the treatment of delirium um, is really identifying and removing those things that may be, um, that you can possibly remove that's causing the person to become delirious. Uh, there's a ton of great research done outside the ICU setting in terms of non-pharmacologic interventions for 
delirium. And a lot of those interventions have been extraordinarily successful, not only reducing the incidence and duration of delirium, but also um, preventing things that are more nosocomial in nature um, that, that can be prevented as well, such as falls and um, pressure ulcers and things like that. So it re the, 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 the imp another important takeaway point is that <clears throat> many of the strategies that we'll be talking about will be multi-component strategies. Um, there are some very basic things that we should be considering in terms of delirium prevention. And we'll be talking about those that um, have been shown in the ICU setting in particular to be helpful. There's also some very common sense approaches that we need to think about when talking about prevention of delirium. Things like sleep enhancements and like John said, the appropriate use of medications. And um, really bringing some of what we know from the geriatric literature to the ICU setting like the things that are on the new Beers criteria list. So medications that um, frequently cause um, cognitive problems in older adults. We also, again, want to focus on um, making sure our patient is in the best possible uh, way to, um, to recover from their critical illness, so making sure vital signs are stable and maintaining that adequate oxygenation level, controlling their pain. Um, while, yes, opioids can um, be deliriogenic, they all, we also know that pain itself um, is associated with the development of um, delirium, so really important to manage and assess for patient's pain and um, looking to make sure that they are having their nutrition and the fluids replaced as needed, giving them the sensory assistive devices that they need, so things like their hearing aids, their, um, their hearing aids or glasses, and things that they use for their activities of daily living when possible in the ICU, and again, the importance of early mobility and rehab. So when we look at the intensive care unit studies that have looked at what I consider to be kind of a non-pharmacologic prevention, there's really three in particular that we'll just review um, quickly today. And they are the importance of um, early mobility, the possible benefit of using a simple approach such as reorienting our patients to their environment, and again, the importance of um, enhancing sleep while patients are in the ICU stu study. So one of the classic studies um, that was not actually conducted too long ago by Dr. Schweikert and colleagues and published in Lancet looked at what would happen if we provided early physical and occupational therapy in mechanically ventilated patients? Um, so the, the study itself actually looked at not only giving these patients PT and OT from the earliest days of mechanical ven ventilation, but also paired the strategy with um, daily awakening trials and an SBT protocol. So really looking at a wake up, breathe, and move kind of um, intervention. What they found is, um, importantly, particularly for older adults, the patients were um, function much more likely to be functionally independent at discharge, okay? So there was a statistically significant increase in patients' function um, at discharge. But interestingly, they also saw this rather wonderful effect on ICU delirium. So they were able to um, uh, decrease the number of ICU days spent delirium and the time in ICU um, spent delirious. So this uh, this protocol combining those interventions of P early PTOT intervention and mobility with SATs and SBTs showing a really good effect on ICU delirium rates. Another interesting study looked at reorienting ICU patients. So Colombo and colleagues um, conducted this observational study. And patients in the intervention group um, underwent what they considered reorientation uh, strategy at that time. Really simple but eloquent approach. Um, what they did is they used something called the five W's and one H scale. Um, so they used things like um, uh, help patients understand how long they'd been in the ICU, where they are, um, and other reorienting strategies. And they were able to um, actually re reduce the incidence of delirium um, significantly. It went from 35% with this simple intervention, um, you know, again, reorienting patients to who, who are you, who's your nurse, what, what happened, when, where, and why. So just the simplicity of using that W approach and how, how did this all happen, um, reduced delirium from 35% to 22%. So a great non-farm intervention that you, can, you might want to consider using in your patients. Again, something that we've probably been doing for years that haven't uh, really considered a reorientation strategy but highlighting the importance of taking that individualized approach with patients. Um, Finally, this was actually a really neat study that was conducted over the course of several different phases, and it looked at the impact of a multifaceted ICU sleep improvement protocol in a medical ICU. 
And in the first phase, they really focused on that sleep. So they did things like shutting off patient's television and at night, dimming the lights, limiting overhead pages um, in the ICU. And then during the day, uh, raising blinds to bring that sunlight in so that the patients know whether it's, not, whether it's night or day, mobilizing the patients. And I like this one, preventing napping. Naps are sometimes important, but you know you don't want the patient to nap all day um, because while they're in the ICU, because then obviously they're not going to sleep too much at night. Um, the second phase involved more um, things in non-delirious patients, like using earplugs and eye mask music. And finally, the third phase looked at um, um, some of the medication-related things that John suggested before. And what they found is, um, you know, this again, even though the, f the project initially was focused on sleep, the odds of delirium um, was were substantially reduced by doing this, again, relatively simple non-pharmacologic intervention in the ICU setting. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, oh, you go ahead, sir. Um, so just to fi uh, finalize with the non, you know, it's really important before administering a medication, and John will speak um, about the medications in the ICU, but really um, what we want you to do is to stop and think. And what we mean by that is, again, Consider the non-medication related reversible factors for delirium, things like the H's, hypoxemia, um, hypotension. Does the patient have a new infection or electrolytes? Looking at the physiologic possible causes of delirium. Um, in terms of the medications, stopping those deliriogenic uh, medications if possible. If not possible, looking at using the lowest dose at, um, the le at the least amount of time possible mobilizing the patients, getting those patients up and moving, and again, optimizing those non-pharmacologic interventions that may reduce delirium, um, the incidence, and the burden. Um, in terms of the PAD guidelines, they emphasize the importance of these non-pharm interventions, um, saying that they do play a very important role in preventing and managing delirium. In particular, the guidelines recommend performing, performing that early mobilization um, um, as early and often as feasible to reduce the incidence and duration of delirium. Um, Michelle, John, mm -hmm. I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, we only have 10 minutes more for, uh, before the call ends, so if you can just uh, wrap up so we could take a few questions. Sure, yep. could. Okay. So um, just the, um, I think the most important thing with delirium uh, prevention is not to use it. <laughs> You know, we're very quick to administer medications to prevent or treat delirium in the ICU. Um, these medications are easy to give. Um, I think we always want sort of a quick fix. Um, as, as Michelle alluded to, some of the non-farm interventions, things like orientation are fairly easy, but early mobilization takes a little bit more re-engineering and work. And I think it's important that we realize that the evidence just isn't there with delirium prevention. Um, there's there's, while there's some perioperative antipsychotic randomized studies looking at reducing delirium burden in non-critically ill patients like hip and knee replacement, et cetera, there's really only one uncontrolled study suggesting that haloperidol may have some benefits. However, in a uh, recent study our group completed where we looked at um, much sicker ICU patients giving um, haloperidol or placebo, uh, to try to prevent delirium, we actually found that there was a trend for more delirium in the Haldol treated group. This is a small study of only um, 68 patients. Much larger studies are ongoing, but until we have evidence, we should not be routinely using antipsychotics to try to prevent the delirium. The same can be said with dexmedetomidine. This is a, the Dexcom study that was done in Australia in um, cardiac surgery patients and actually found there was a trend for more delirium when dexmedetomidine was administered rather than morphine. So that's really read that led the uh, PAD guidelines to suggest that um, you know there's really not a role for um, any pharmacologic recommend prevention in delirium. I just want to spend a couple times on patients with delirium with um, treatment of delirium because um, some of these same themes um, are important to highlight. Uh, we certainly know that antipsychotics are used extremely commonly um, in the ICU, and this data has been shown over and over again in clinician surveys. Um, there's a, there's a, you know, really three antipsychotic placebo-controlled delirium treatment studies, um, some of which included patients that um, did not have delirium in admission but were at high risk for developing delirium, 
Um, in the first study, the MIND study compared Haldol to prazodone and placebo and found that there was virtually no difference in delirium coma-free days, delirium days, how fast delirium resolved, mortality, no matter how you slice it, there was no difference. So I think it's important to realize that um, this is a negative study. Um, although there is a large multi-center study called the Minds USA study that's currently enrolling patients that will, will certainly be informative in this area. Um, another British study is the Hope ICU study where they um, looked at mechanically ventilated critically ill patients, gave them Haldol 2.5288 or placebo, um, and found that, again, no difference in delirium coma-free days, number of days in delirium, the number of ventilator-free days in the first 14 days, or the QTC prolongation. So again, another negative study, so there's really no support for giving haloperidol to routinely treat delirium in ICU patients. This is a study I published four years ago. Um, it's a pilot double-blind randomized control study of quetiapine or Seroquel um, for treatment of delirium. Now, we did find in this extremely small study of 36 patients that delirium did resolve faster with quetiapine. But it's important to realize that um, you know all the patients in the placebo group could get as needed haloperidol. So this is you know very low evidence that suggests that maybe there's some benefit with quetiapine. But this needs to be evaluated in much much larger studies. And personally, at our, my institution, Tufts Medical Center, we're, we use very very few antipsychotics in our patients with delirium. I think the most important thing to really focus on are patients that are um, either acutely agitated that's not related to pain, patients that have bothersome symptoms, as Michelle alluded to, like fear or hallucinations. Um, but just because someone has a positive ICDSC or a positive cam ICU doesn't mean that antipsychotics should always just be started. If patients are extremely agitated that's not related to pain and they're on a benzodiazepine infusion, switching to, there's two studies suggesting that switching to dexmedetomidine will resolve delirium faster in both the men's study as well as the SEDCOM study. Lastly, I think the fact that um, cholinesterase inhibitors like ribostigmine, um, for years we thought that there might be some mechanistic advantage of using these drugs um, when they were rigorously evaluated to treat delirium in a large um, European study. Mortality actually was three times greater in the rivastigmine group, and there was actually no benefit on delirium. So the take-home message from this is we need large, adequately powered, well-designed studies to really look at it. And these smaller studies, um, you know, even if they suggest there's some benefit, are very low-level evidence. And so we have to really be careful about our, um, you know, pharmacologic treatment strategies for delirium. And if we do, we need to evaluate it each day and certainly have a, um, uh, you know, a, a, a decision-making point as patients transition over the ICU in terms of continuing these agents. Okay, Michelle, it's yours. We uh, will tie up and answer some questions. Now, I did just want to, before we close, um, really refer you to some really great web uh, resources in terms of <clears throat> um, ICU delirium pr assessment prevention and management. In particular, if you get to go to the I SCCM ICU Liberation webpage, um, and also some upcoming events that are happening. Um, for example, in, uh, we'll be in Nashville in September 9th, and there will be an ICU Liberation Animation implementing the new Pain, Agitation, and Delirium Guidelines Conference there. We are also, with um, the support of the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation and SCCM, beginning to start our ABCDEF Bundle Improvement Collaborative, and there um, you can find more information at that, re um, at that link there. And finally, again, the um, ICU Delirium and Cognitive Impairment Study Group, which has a ton of valuable resources. But we'd love to take some questions from the audience. Uh, thank you, Michelle and John. Um, so this question, uh, Michelle, I think is for you. It's uh, duration of, deli uh, of delirium is associated with, with increased mortality, ventilator length of stay, et cetera. Is there evidence that delirium is the cause of these effects, or delirium is simply more common in sicker patients? So that's a great story, and I think both John and I will answer that. Um, it, it, so the, the evidence that we have to date does control for those things. If the question is, you know, do we know if it's an independent effect, so the answer would be yes. So with the studies that we have that compared um, mortality and, and things like that for delirious and non-delirious patients, many of the models 
they use things that um, are um, already known to be associated with mortality. So things like um, severity of illness, age, you know, the sicker you are, the more likely you die. The older you are, the more likely you die. And when you put those variables into these models, um, delirium, can, um, again, consistently is associated with those outcomes. And I, think, and I think we need more data, though. We, we cert there's certainly association, but um, you know, we published a, a network meta-analysis last year where we looked at all the studies that have looked at interventions trying to decrease duration of delirium, and we actually found, in fact, that overall these studies, like using mobilization, you know, all the things we've talked about in this presentation do decrease delirium duration, but when then we looked at the effect on shorter-term mortality, um, we actually did not find there was association. So um, we need larger studies that really look at the mortality part of it, um, because the best way to look at this is through randomized studies, not through systematic reviews or cohort analyses. The problem is, obviously, you can't randomize people to become delirious or not delirious. Correct. And if we look, and, and if we, you know, step outside the ICU again, I think there's a ton of consistent literature, and multiple meta-analyses that have been done, um, that looked at delirium outside the ICU center, uh, outside the ICU, um, and the independent effect. Again, independent meaning if you control for those other variables, the independent effect that delirium has on mortality. So collectively, I think the evidence is pretty strong. And again, John's right. There's just simply no way you can design a trial where you're going to randomize people to delirium or no delirium. Okay. Thank you, Michelle and John. Um, I think we can take one more question. Um, I think, John, this is for you. Uh, is there evidence about statin use or withdrawal as a, as a risk factor for delirium? And can Ambien help prevent delirium in patients with sleep deprivation? Yeah, um, so the first question is um, the use of statin um, withdrawal. Uh, and what its role. There's certainly, there's actually been conflicting cohort analysis, one showing that it was um, use of a, continuing use of a statin was associated with um, delirium, um, you know, prevalence. Um, one other study actually did not show the same. And it, it gets down to the nuts and bolts of how you design these studies and look at other conflicting um, variables associated with delirium and whether you're looking at the daily transition. So um, I think, you know, there's certainly, if someone's on a statin at home and it, we can administer it, you know, down their feeding tube, um, it certainly, you know, I would advocate that statin therapy be continued. There wouldn't be a reason to start it, but certainly we, we certainly don't have evidence that, um, you know, statin therapy should be started or initiated in a patient to try to prevent delirium. In terms of Ambien, it's really tricky in terms of the connection between sleep and delirium. We certainly know that um, things that we could do, particularly in the non-pharmacologic things like um, noise reduction, earplugs, um, you know, many of these things are going to help reduce delirium. But interesting, um, you know, what the Hopkins group found in, in the, the phase study Michelle presented is they actually found there was no improvement in sleep quality. So there seems to be some kind of independent effect of interventions that maybe are meant to improve sleep and reducing delirium. So um, I would be careful about giving Ambien to patients to try to reduce delirium. Um, we, there's not good evidence, you would need a randomized study, and there's not good evidence that giving a pharmacologic agent to try to improve sleep in patients um, it decreases delirium or improves other outcome. We just don't have that data. Um, but realizing there's patients that we do need to calm at night to try to get them to sleep. So, um, you know, in rare patients, we need to use these pharmacologic sleep aids, but it, it, there's not evidence that they should be routinely used. Great. So we're almost at the top of the hour. So thank you uh, for joining us today. This will conclude our ICU liber uh, liberation webinar, and thank you. Uh, John and Michelle for your efforts for preparing uh, this informative webcast and thank you to our audience for your participation. Uh, you may share this webcast with your colleagues by visiting www.iculiberation.org. Thank you. Bye.